sneaking out here randomly. Thank you. Do we need this music stand out front, Jay? I'm sorry, I use I use it for Thursday. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? Hey, well, we're gonna get started this morning. Would you stand with us? How many of you guys are excited about being in the presence of God this morning? Father God, right now, we just release peace into this place right now. Father God, we release freedom into this place that every chain would break in here, Lord God. Father God, that we would be released to worship you. That we would be released, Father, to praise you with every single fiber of our being, Lord. Father God, that we would be released this morning. Father, I speak that over this church, over this congregation of people. Lord God, that we would be released to worship you, released to encounter you, Lord God, to encounter the Lord our God this morning. You are everything, Lord God. You are everything to us. Amen. Everybody say amen. Amen. Come on. Hey, uh, before we get started, hey, just look at your neighbor and say, hey, man, I'm glad that you are here. Come on, look, look to your left. And look to your right and say, I am so glad you're here. God is going to do something awesome this morning. Amen? Amen. Let's do this. Oh 
Fear is gone this morning. No worship you forever. No matter what it costs, Lord, say I'm gonna worship you forever. I choose, I make my choice right now and say I'm gonna worship you forever. I'm gonna worship you. Lord, I choose to worship you. Choice, Lord God, I say, Lord, I'm gonna worship you forever. I'm gonna worship you. Oh, I'm gonna worship you forever. I'm gonna worship you. See, here I am, and yeah. here I am, and I'm worshiping you with all I am. Lord. I worship. Spirit and truth, lifted hands, worshiping you. Hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope. 
hope is built on nothing left in Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest phrase, but wholly trust in Jesus.
legislation this morning. He's Lord because He's Lord. He's Lord because He created it all. He was before time began. He's Lord of all. Oh, He is Lord. He's Lord. He is Lord. Every knee will bow. Every tongue.
I want you to hear the power of those words. Your love, it never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out of supply. And we need to understand this as we sing this to the depth of our soul. When we talk about God's love, we're not talking about an emotion. We're not talking about the way he feels about us. We're talking about the way he feels toward us. See, God chooses to love us. And when we say his love, it means he desires nothing but our good. He desires your good. He wills good into your life. And that's how he shows his love. What area of your life this morning needs the goodness of God to saturate it? Is there an area of your life that the enemy has come in like a storm, but there's a flood of love coming in that God's going to raise up as a standard against it? Is there an area where the goodness of God needs to overwhelm the forces of evil? If there's an area in your life where you need the good God, the God that loves you and wills nothing but your good, to flood your life with that, not with an emotional feeling, but with the reality of the goodness that will never run out of it, it'll never run dry, it'll never be short of that kind of love. I want you to step out into the aisle. Right now, if that's you, you need something and you need the goodness of God to just be displayed in your life. Just step out into the aisle right now. Amen. Amen. God's good because he heals. God's good because he restores. God's good because he redeems. God's good because he loves us. There are those that are standing in the aisles right now. They're standing there as an act of faith. And we're going to choose right now to partner with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we're going to begin to declare over these individuals the goodness of God, the love of God in their lives. There's an area that needs to be flooded with the love of God. Will you place your hands upon them? If you're standing around, there's some people. If you're standing in the aisle and no one's touching you, I want you to raise your hands up and let them know I'm not here on accident. The goodness of God. I want you to know as they lay hands upon you, this is a tangible act because we're in agreement that God's love is his desire for your good. I want you to hear me. God desires your good. Well, Father, we lay hands on these people and we begin to decree and declare and agree with you that you don't wish for their good, you decree and declare their good. Whatever area that the enemy has come against them, raise up a flood of your love, of your goodness as a standard right now in their lives. A flood of your goodness, Father, your healing virtue, your redemptive power, your, your heavenly resources. We impart and deposit heaven's goodness into these lives right now. We know your love never ends, it never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out. You are more than enough, Father. And your love for us is overwhelming us right now. I pray right now, Father, that the love that you have for them will become the most real thing in this moment. That they will be overwhelmed by the love you have for them, by the incredible desire for good you have for them, and that nothing bad in their life, nothing wrong, nothing evil, nothing hurtful comes from you, that you are there reconciling, restoring, redeeming, and returning in the name of Jesus Christ. We release heaven's goodness into their lives right now in the name of Jesus. Let's lift up our hands and begin to celebrate and receive what God has done. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you that we can come to you in our time of need. Thank you that when the enemy comes in like a flood, you come in against him and you raise up a standard. He can't compare to you. His thievery won't withstand you. It is your goodness, your life, your love that we celebrate this morning. His love never ends. It never fails. It never gives up.
Ain't God good? Ain't he good? I want you to say this with me. God loves me. He only wants good for me. And I trust him. Amen. Well, God bless you this morning. Woo! Good job. Good job. Are we blessed by a great worship team? Give them a hand. Give them a hand this morning. Several of them went out to California to, to study and to learn and get some impartation. Others just saturate themselves every day in God's presence so that we can have a call to worship this morning. We appreciate their, their ministry so much. Well, you know, when we look around and think about God's goodness, it is overwhelming. It's overwhelming that the God of heaven and earth, the Bible says he doesn't sleep, he doesn't slumber. He doesn't need to take a break, he doesn't need a rest, he doesn't need a siesta, that he just spends all of his time loving us, wanting our good, working on our behalf, and that's a God we can worship. It's a God we can trust and celebrate. It's a God that uh, perfect love, the Bible says, cast out all fear. It's that love that we share this morning. This morning, we have a lot of good things going on. We have baptisms happening this morning for those that have followed uh, the Lord. You know, the Bible says that there's something that we ought to do when we become a believer in Jesus Christ. It says, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, Peter was preaching a great message, and it says that they were pricked at their heart. You know, there's a time in every believer's life where we felt that same prick, where you thought, how could I live without him? I can't go on anymore. He says, at that point, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Times of refreshing comes in at that point. Jesus told us to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, we baptize in just a moment. We're going to celebrate our baptism service, and I'm going into a little bit more detail because I want you to know this. We don't have a baptism service because we need to get people wet. We could just get a water hose and sprinkle people and say we had a service. We do that because we do immersion. We go under the water and raise up. The Bible says it's the best picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But there's another reason we do that. That picture of immersion is being completely overwhelmed in the reality of the love of God, the love of the, the presence of the Holy Spirit, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the redemptive power of Jesus Christ. So as we celebrate baptism in just a moment, we're saying to all these individuals that are going out and being baptized that we want to be a part of inundating them, overwhelming them, covering them with the knowledge of the love of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit, and the redemption of Jesus Christ. So we celebrate baptism this morning. For those that are going to be baptized, We've got a little hiccup this morning. We have a staff that's not, not here today, me and you. You're baptizing your boys this morning. Yes, Woo! Woo! <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to do some announcements. We're going to invite Dennis up to take up the offering. I'm going to go out there and talk to him about baptism. Jerry's going to do baptism. I'm going to come back here and preach. Then you get to go home. Okay, it'll be real quick. It'll be real quick. So we'll make it fast. But there's some uh, things that you need to know about. God is doing great and wonderful things in our community. I'm, in, in our church, but when we say community church, we're talking about we're, we want to be a sample of what God's doing in Orange, in the area, in the community. God has started to gather churches together, and he's taken down competitiveness and all these different things. And on August the 17th, we're going to take Darren Williams' vision. When he came here from New Orleans with Katrina, God blew him and his family in here. The enemy tried to, to hurt them, but they, he, God said, look, let me direct your paths and guide you. He comes in here with a heart for kids, and he begins out of their poverty situation where they didn't have much, but he wasn't dependent on what he had. He was dependent on the resources of heaven. So he didn't look at poverty. He looked at abundance and said, we're going to supply backpacks and back-to-school needs for the kids. Started doing that out of their home. We joined in, found out some other churches were doing that. Last year, uh, 15 different churches did something different on different days. Well, every one of those churches came together and said, it's not about us, it's about him. And so they all said, we're going to get together. That is huge, guys. Give these churches a hand. 
I'm telling you, the most dangerous thing to the enemy's camp is for the churches of Jesus Christ to become one. Unity will destroy the enemy. And so what's happened is these churches came together, and on August the 17th, we're going to come together, and at Lions Park, we're going to have a back-to-school uh, drive. We're going to give away school supplies. Each church is going to have their own thing that they can give away. Some are going to give away uniforms, some socks and underwear. It's just like Christmas. Need socks and underwear. And you give all, they'll have all kind of things. There'll be other services there. And we will be there representing the body of Christ coming together to do good to our kids. Isn't that exciting? Well, uh, it's not free. It's exciting, but not free. And so what I would encourage you to do is uh, don't scratch out tithe. Don't do that. Uh, but when we give the offering in just a little while, if you want to give toward that, uh, just write a little memo uh, above and beyond your offering and put in there uh, back to school celebration or something. And we'll make sure that money. We're actually not doing it under community church. And we're not doing it under First Baptist Church or any other. We're doing it under Orange Christian Services. So everybody knows it's not one church. It's the body of Christ. And so that money will go to Orange Christian Services to help fund this ministry. I'm excited about it. I hope you can tell. Last year we did 400, no, 300 backpacks and like 180 uniforms. This year we're, going, we're shooting for the 1,000 mark, all right? We're going to do great things for the kingdom of God joined together. There's other things happening uh, this week. Tonight, uh, Carol Lee will be speaking a very timely message in the service tonight. We normally do the uh, uh, harp and bowl, but tonight we're going to have a regular service. So please come out and support Carol. Kind of stand up and wave your hand a little bit so everybody knows who you are. Carol Lee uh, is... Uh, a prophetess, she speaks prophetically, and uh, uh, her husband Bill also speaks. They come, and I asked them to come and be a part of our church a year ago, and we're just now really getting the ball rolling on what her ministry is going to look like here at Community and branching out. A lot of people have been supporting her, but as a body, let's come and support her tonight and hear what's going on. There's also a school that she's offering on the 26th and 27th of this month to uh, discover your spiritual gifts and how to use it. You can get with her on more details on that. Uh, some other things that are happening in our body involve mission trips. Uh, Mary Beth has got a team in Mexico. Please keep them in prayer this week. They're, they're moving in the supernatural already. Great things are already happening. And yet the enemy doesn't like it. So there's some other things happening at the same time. That's just how it works. And so keep them in prayer. We sent Aaron to Madrid, Spain. And uh, I drove five, uh, no, nine hours one day and seven hours yesterday I'm hurting, uh, uh, but we, we dropped him off, and he's heading out to Madrid, Spain. Some other people are doing ministry as well, so keep these things in prayers. This is what God has called us to, to go out from this place and bring the goodness of God with us everywhere we go. You are ambassadors for Christ. You have the ministry of reconciliation, and every time you go, God's people make a difference. Amen? So there's other things. Make sure you look in your bulletin and see what else is going on. Uh, God bless you. Dennis, will you come up and prepare for the tithe and offering? Those that are being baptized, if you'll meet me out the door to your right, my left, we'll see you there in just a moment. I talked over your applause. I'm sorry. That's God's applause anyway. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like golf clapping. <laughs> Well, good morning. It's good to be here. Uh, you know, I find myself in the same position that I think probably some other people do sometimes. There's things I do where I connect with God and I draw life from them and uh, set aside time for them. Uh, but the truth is, sometimes life gets so busy, it gets in the way. And I find myself not doing the things I know that are life-giving to me. And uh, I was very blessed a couple weeks ago to be able to leave for a few days and, and go and just set aside some time to be with God and spend time in prayer, spend time in His Word, and, and listen to what He was telling me. And uh, it was a tremendously powerful and refreshing time for me. And each day I met with a person that was helping me uh, in my retreat. And this person would give me two or three scripture texts and uh, just ask that I spend 30, 45 minutes on each one of these during the day, just praying that scripture and hearing what God was saying to me. And one of them that he gave me was out of Philippians uh, chapter 4. 
where he says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Well, when he gave me that scripture, I thought, well, I already know that scripture. When I, how am I going to spend 30 or 45 minutes just praying and, and thinking on that scripture? I already know it. Well, <laughs> God's so good. And uh, as I spent some time just reflecting on that scripture, he began to speak to me. And a lot of what we talk about is trusting God. Trusting God, not just trusting God to get us to heaven someday. I mean, I, mean, I trust He will, but trusting God with my very life right now. And that's challenging. And the biggest enemy of trust, I believe, is anxiety. See, because when I'm anxious, I'm not trusting. I talk about my cats a lot, I know, and uh, we had one that had a lot of trouble trusting us and because he was always anxious and worried and skittish, and now he's learned to trust us, and he'll lay on his little back and let us scratch his stomach. And uh, <laughs> I used to think people that had pets were just stupid because they, you know, they bought food and took them to the veterinarian, like, do you not have a life? What are you doing? Anyway... <laughs> And they were smarter than I thought. We get more joy from those kittens. Uh, so we, where was I? <laughs> well, uh, see, that, that cat was so anxious. He was worried. He was fearful. What would happen if he trusted us? And, and that's the way we can be with God. We're just so anxious and worried. But the Word of God says, be anxious for nothing. And I spent some time thinking on that. Be anxious for nothing. What would life look like if I really could just be anxious for nothing? And see, some people would say, well, you can't do that. That's not possible. You're going to always be anxious about something. Well, I don't know. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said in Philippians 4, don't be anxious for anything. Now, I just don't think he told us to do something that was not within the realm of what, by the help of God, I can do. And so, uh, will it happen overnight? No, but can we move in that direction? So he says, don't be anxious for anything, but with prayer and supplication, make your request known to God. You don't just stop being anxious, you start praying. You replace thinking about the problem with thinking about the solution. You replace worry with prayer. And then you couple it with, you couple it with thanksgiving. He says, but in everything, with prayer and thanks, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. What does thanksgiving add to it? Thanksgiving draws my mind back over and over to the faithfulness of God. The Jewish people understood this. When they came to God, they said, the same God who delivered us out of Egypt, the same God that took us through the Red Sea, the same God that led us by day with a pillar, with a cloud, and by night with a pillar of fire, the same God that provided manna in the wilderness, the same God that brought us into the promised land, that God is the one I'll come to with my prayers today. And we need to be the same way. We need to be rehearsing. What has God done in our life? Because that's what Thanksgiving does. And I start thinking, yeah, God did this, and He did this, and remember when He did that. And all of a sudden, that anxiety begins to melt away, and instead, peace that passes understanding takes its place. And so instead of anxiety standing in the way of trust through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, faith is released. Faith is released. And I don't know of any area where that's more easily manifest than in giving because the thing that holds us back from being faithful to what God asks us to do with our finances is anxiety. Well, Lord, if I give that money, what will happen in the rest of my life? Well, Lord, if I tithe, how would I pay the rest of my bills. Lord, if I let you run my finances, what would my life look like? And we have all this anxiety that if we be obedient to God, maybe our life wouldn't turn out so good. And anxiety is just the enemy of trust. And so what do we do? We listen to Paul. Be anxious for nothing. And really, I was supposed to spend about 30 or 45 minutes in that text just thinking about it and praying about it. And I ended up in the course of that day spending between two and three hours just thinking about what would life be like without anxiety? No anxiety. No anxiety. 
What would it be like to immediately move from worry into prayer? What would it be like to faithfully couple that prayer with thanksgiving and feel the peace of God flood through us? And so today, as we receive tithes and offerings and money toward backpacks, it's just a chance to say no to anxiety and yes to trust. Because he's trustworthy. Amen? Amen. If the esters will stand to receive the tithes and offerings. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Lord, we bless you. We praise you. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that truly the same God who has come through us for us so many times that we trust you to do it again, God. Do it again. In Jesus' name, amen.
friend of mine, Serena Jack. Can I say anything? Yeah, we have to tell Jesus this is for him, and thanks, Sally, for being the light that brought Christmas. Because of her profession of faith and her love for the Lord, Serena Jack, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Give us a second while, uh, you know, the family comes up. And, uh, <laughs> I hate to sit up and look and take things with little legs up here. But good job. Uh, well, these are my boys. And uh, this is Nathaniel Tyler. And, uh, man, I'm just so proud. So very proud. Uh, we, uh, we come from a long, long line of, of just God followers and Jesus lovers. And uh, my kids are, are following in those steps. And uh, I'm so very proud. I see leadership. Uh, and so we're looking at the future church, guys. Whenever we see these young people up here, we're looking at church. And uh, so, uh, so so turn around and look. Yeah, turn around and sit down right here, baby. Awesome. Okay. You ready? Do you have anything to say? You love Jesus with all your heart? All right. He doesn't want to say anything. It's all right. All right. There you go. So now because of your public profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. This is Micah Allen, and uh, he's my little blessing, and uh, man, he's just an awesome little boy. He's very independent and, uh, and cold right now, so I'll, I'll go ahead and shut up, and, uh, <laughs> and I'll baptize him. Go ahead and sit down, hang your feet over to the side right there, buddy. Yeah, sit down right there. Micah, do you have anything you want to say? Okay. Uh, do you love Jesus with your whole heart? Now, because of your public profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. All righty, we, we are good to go. Isn't that great to see families coming together and celebrating? Well, this morning we're going to continue on uh, the Jesus habits, looking at the habits that Jesus had as a part of his life. You know, the thing about it that we look at, when we talk about the Jesus habits, we're really just trying to find an easy way to describe bringing into our lives the things that Jesus had into his life. And the truth is, when it comes to the life of Christ, we can't cherry pick certain things we like and certain things we don't like. He's a package deal. You get all or none. And so we're not trying to say, hey, these are some things, if you do them, you're going to be better. Because if you do them apart with Christ, you're just going to be doing some stuff. But in Christ, these behaviors that Christ had a part of his life seem to bear fruit and seem to be a huge part of what he was imparting to our lives. You know, I don't believe Jesus did anything on accident. You know, can you imagine the most brilliant mind ever to exist? Live in every day with intentionality. And every day surrounded for three and a half years with some followers that were going to emulate not only what he did in that moment, but how he lived. That his life was intentional at every turn. 
And so this morning we're going to talk about how intentional he was about the habit of prayer and what prayer uh, means to Jesus and what it seems uh, to mean to Jesus and what it should mean to us. Now, when I started thinking about this, I was driving home. I told you I had these long drives. And so yesterday I, be, I was getting ready to leave and, and because I was going to be driving from Denton home with nobody in the car, I figured I need to do some study and I could download some sermons or whatever. And, and I'm one of those kind of weirdos, I listen to sermons while I drive. And so I downloaded and some of these came to my mind about how many times Brother David or myself may have preached on prayer. And so I went back on our podcast from the year 2009 to now. And between Brother David and myself, we've preached to community church 15 times on the subject of prayer. That's not counting Wednesday nights when we talked about prayer on Wednesday nights. And so it seems to me that God's trying to say something to us as a congregation about the importance and value of prayer in our lives. And you know, the truth is, is that every human heart was designed to connect to God. Do you believe that? Every human heart was designed to connect to God. Now, there's some people that live in constant denial of that, but, you know, they're just denying the fact that that's how they were created. I could deny the fact that gravity is real. It doesn't make it less real. There are people that still deny whether we landed on the moon or not. I don't don't know. You just deny some things. But the reality is when it comes to the need for prayer in our lives and connecting with God, It's a real thing. And when we think about uh, at the very beginning in Genesis, the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve walked with God. In fact, he describes face-to-face encounters with God. Well, things changed. And because of change, communication with God changed. And at that point, we started calling it prayer. We started referring to the communication with God as prayer because it was no longer face-to-face, but it was no less real. When we think about some of the great heroes of the faith, we look at their their life of prayer. We look at David, and as we read through the Psalms, some of the Psalms that we sing or that we study were his prayers, and some of them were prayers of anguish and frustration, and some of them were prayers of excitement and exhilaration, and yet he prayed. We look at uh, Moses when, when uh, he was interceding for the nation of Israel, prayer. And so we follow these uh, Abraham and go all the way through Gideon and keep moving forward throughout the Old Testament with Isaiah and Ezekiel. And then we get further on into Amos and we keep going along and we get all the way to Malachi. And we see these prophets and people of God praying and communicating with God. And somewhere it became a little bit maybe rote and maybe even a little bit religious at some level and the prayers were already kind of made out and fashioned. Well, Jesus comes on and when he gets there, his prayers are so different. They're not like everybody else's prayers that the Israelites had heard. They weren't kind of prescribed and pre-done. Now, they were no real different than us in many ways because they had their conventional prayer times as well. They prayed before bed and when they woke up and they prayed uh, at some point during the meal or before or after the meal. And, and so they had these kind of consistent prayer times. But when Jesus prayed, it was so different to hear that something in them said, you got to show us how you're doing. What are you doing? That just sounds different. It, it impacts differently. But if we don't see that prayer engages us to a level beyond hearing, we miss it. Because so often, if we think, well, Jesus prayed so eloquently that they want to be taught how to pray eloquently, well, I think we're going to miss the heart of it. Have you ever been around someone that prays like really good? I mean, they're like professional prayers. You're like, you could hire them to pray because they don't... There's no uhs, there's no ums, there's no, uh, you know, some people when they pray, they get nervous and you hear like Father God like a thousand times. Thank you, Father God, love you, Father God, Father God, will you, Father God, Father God. And because we're nervous and the people are around and, and are, we're, are we doing it right? Well, there's some people that they don't, they don't do that. They just flow. And you think how intimidating it could be. To be not just around someone in this church that prays really well, but around the Messiah, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he's no us and these and buts and whatevers and ums. And he's just talking with God. 
But I think what made the apostles look at him, the disciples, the learners look at him and say, teach us what you're doing, is because his prayers were connected with action, with results. Things were happening around him. They weren't just empty prayers. They just weren't nice uh, uh, words strung together in an eloquent manner. They were changing the atmosphere. They were moving things. And so I want to talk about that this morning. How many of you, don't raise your hand, but how many of you have struggled with the idea of prayer? How many of us know that we ought to pray, but we don't pray? <clears throat> the Bible tells us that we ought to pray without ceasing. We're to, in everything, give thanks. And we start thinking of the re reasons we don't want to pray and the things we're not thankful for. And it challenges us. And yet Jesus showed us some different things. Turn with me to Luke chapter 3. We're going to start off at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. In fact, Jesus uh, was being talked about by John before he really showed up and, and, and began to show his public ministry. And, and John's talking about this one that's going to come after him, who he's not even worthy to loose his sandals. John the Baptist is who I'm talking about. And he's talking about Jesus, the Lamb of God, that will take away the sins of the world and one day, here comes Jesus, and, and John is in the middle of baptizing people for repentance of sin, and he looks and he says, behold the Lamb of God. And everybody's heads turn. And then Jesus comes down, and I want to pick up in verse 21. Chapter 3, verse 21, it says this, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed... The heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved son and you I am well pleased. I want you to know it is my firm belief that prayer opens heaven. Just I believe it. See, I don't believe Jesus went through the process of baptism just as a, a side footnote or a little something extra that uh, we would talk about in southeast Texas, southwest Louisiana as lanyap, just a little extra. It wasn't just a little extra. Everything Jesus did matters. And he showed us through his baptism, it says, he prayed. At his baptism, he prayed and heaven opened up. I want you to know when you begin to pray, when you add in the habit of prayer into your life, heaven begins to open up. When people talk about, I just don't feel God's presence, I don't, I don't hear him, his word isn't alive to me. Before long, I leave the word and I start going, wait a minute, are you, are you talking with him? Are you spending time with him? Are, are you communicating with him? Because if you're not communicating with God, if you're not talking with him, if you're not hearing from him, everything else becomes stale and stagnant. But prayer, spending time with God will open up heaven. Imagine heaven opened up over your life. Can you imagine that? Can you enter into this story for just a moment? Could you just imagine yourself being there when Jesus begins to pray? I don't know, was it loud? Was it quiet? Was it reverent? Was his head bowed? Was his head lifted? I don't know. All I know is he prayed. Imagine being a spectator and hearing the voice of God. You know, there are people, I believe, that are the spectators of life, needing desperately to hear the voice of God. And it's up to you and I to open up heaven so a supernatural voice can get their attention. They may not hear it with their audible ears, but they can hear it with their spiritual ears. I'm telling you, I'm living an example of a day when God said, I am yours and you are mine. I didn't hear it with my, uh, my flesh ears, my physical ears, but I heard it with my spirit. And on uh, 16th Street and 19th 1989, I responded to the call of God on my life, and it has changed my life because there were some people who were praying, and heaven opened up over a sinner like me. I'm telling you, when we begin to talk to God and begin to communicate with God, heaven will open up, and people will hear. There were some people at Community Church on 16th Street that I, I would talk to Miss Jerry about or Pastor David about and say, what happened to these people? I remember these people. And I, I remember, boy, they used to do this. And 
It was like a show for me. I, I was brand new to Christ and, and I'd hear an amen or someone would touch someone on the head and they'd fall down. I was like, well, that's crazy, but it's fun. I just like to watch it. I say, what happened to this person and where's this person at now? It was, it was my story. It was my life. It was changing to me because so much of that had to do with my experience and of hearing God call me by name. There are people that desperately need to hear God's voice. And they're not going to hear it on their own accord. They're going to hear it because you and I pray and heaven opens up. What area do you need heaven to open up? Do you need heaven to open up over your finances? Do you need it to open up over your, over your marriage? Do you need to open it up over your family, your children? Do you need to open it up over your workplace? We'll become a man and woman of prayer and let heaven open up. And now we begin to look at how heaven opens up. I remember the, we looked through the, the gospels and then move into the epistles, the story of the church, and we look at Acts and the history of the church. And we get in the, and in the history of the church these wonderful narratives of the life of the apostles. And it tells us about Paul and Silas being in a Roman prison. They've been beaten, their stripes upon their back, and they begin to pray and sing, and heaven opens up. But not only does heaven open up, <laughs> the jail opens up. God moves when his people pray. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, then what will happen? He says he will hear from heaven. He will forgive their sins and heal their land. There's a promise when God's people begin to talk to him, he begins to move. He hears them. He opens up heaven and begins to touch lives. Are there people around you that they need their life touched? I've said earlier that you and I were called to be ambassadors for Christ. We have a ministry of reconciliation according to the Holy Spirit through Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians. A ministry of reconciliation. Is that ministry going on in our lives? But not only are we called to pray because it opens up heaven, it allows heaven to respond. Did you know God is waiting on you and me? Isn't it amazing that the sovereign, powerful God responds to us in prayer? Faith moves God. There are times that God does not move until men and women pray and exercise the God-given authority to invoke heaven on earth. That sounds crazy to me. Why would he do that? Because he loves us. I want you to remember, what is the church of Jesus Christ called to be? The bride of Christ. Now, Jesus is called the King of kings and Lord of lords. Well, what is the bride of a king called? Thank you. It wasn't a trick question. Thank you. Now, it's kind of hard for me to go here because thinking of myself as a bride is a little awkward. <laughs> Calling me a queen makes something inside me want to fight. A little awkward here. But I'm telling you, God wants his bride, his queen, to learn to rule and reign with him. And so he's preparing us now to learn how to exercise the authority he has given the church to rule and reign with him. As we sit on his throne as co-heirs with Christ, we exercise the authority. Well, we pray very passively many times, not my will, but what? Your will be done. Let God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And for some reason, we've made that the most passive prayer possible. When do we pray, not my will, but your will be done? When things are going down the toilet, we go, well, not my will, but your will be done. I don't understand it. Go ahead. Or we begin to say, or we don't know what to pray. It's real confusing to us. So we say, well, not my will, but your will be done. Did Jesus ever pray that way? Did he ever throw his hands up in there and go, not my will, but your will be done? The one time Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done is when he was in Gethsemane and he's saying, I don't want to do what you want me to do, but I know full well what it is. 
He wasn't in ignorance praying it. He was with cold, stark reality saying, I don't really want to go there, but if you want me to, I'm going. And in the, in the uh, Lord's Prayer, the model prayer, he's telling us it's our role to bring heaven to earth. God wants to work through us. He's, he's wired it that way. He's constructed it that way. You are not only a child of God, you're not only a co-heir with Christ, you are the body, the bride of Christ, and he wants you to exercise the authority that he's called you to. And prayer begins that in our lives. As we begin to talk to him, we begin to hear what his will is. Imagine this. Jesus went around healing all manner of sickness and disease. Is that right? In Acts, it tells us, in Acts 10, 38, that that was his ministry. In 1 John 3, 8, it says, Jesus was manifest for this reason to destroy the works of the enemy. So Jesus went around healing all manner of sickness and disease. I want to ask you, why didn't Jesus just prop his foot up, get some lemonade, and just say, your will be done? Kind of flamboyantly, your will be done. And just left it. He could have. Because Jesus did nothing outside of the Father's will. And these people weren't healed. Before Jesus walked in, uh, came to them, they were not healed. It wasn't until Jesus spoke what was the will of the Father that they became healed. And it wasn't until they knew what the will of the Father was that the disciples began to do the same thing. So here's the school of Christ. He does what he doesn't have to do to teach us what we must know. He sits back and says, for the Father's will to be done and heal this person, this leper, and this woman with the issue of blood, and Jairus' daughter, and this demoniac. I'm going to spend time with the Father because I want to train my people that they need to know my will and hear his voice. So he got up early in the morning, the Bible says, and he began to hear from God in the heart of God. And then he lived his life on a daily mission. He said he didn't do anything without Uh, repeating what the father had said or what he had taught and he begins to live out of this place and so he's teaching us this and then what the disciples do they begin to wait and then one day Jesus said hey I want you to go do what I've been doing I'm giving you all authority to cast out demons and pick up serpents and heal the sick and cleanse the lepers and do all this stuff right and they didn't go until he sent them they didn't go until they had his will why do we pray Not so that we can know the will of God passively. Not so we can throw up our hands and not have to engage. He says, I pray because I want my bride, my body, my people to know what's on the mind of the head of the church so that the body can live out in the authority of the church and learn to rule and reign with me and bring my will to earth the same way it's in heaven. We will not see God move in our lives the way we want to when we just decide it's our will. You know what? There's a lot of places that build, uh, that expect God to respond, but we get the order wrong. I'm telling you, God responds to us. But he responds to us as we respond to him. What do I mean by that? See, we could, we, we could, we talk about dreams and visions and believing for God. Now, I want you to know, you and I could sit down and get a group of people together and say, uh, give me some dreams and visions, and we could begin to get on a whiteboard and come up with some great, brilliant plans. And they'd be wonderful, and they'd be fully intended to bring glory to God and expand the kingdom in orange and get people saved. And we could take these plans and say, God, these are the most brilliant plans we can come up with. Do you bless them? Will you bless our best efforts? Because without you blessing our best efforts, they won't work. That's one way. Or another way is to say, Father, where are you working in orange? What's on your heart in orange? Because all I want to do is join you where you already are. See, one is us saying, God, respond to our best efforts. And the other is saying, God, we're responding to where you are and we want to join you there. I can tell you which one I want to do. I want to join him where he already's working. I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I don't want to come up with my best plans. It's his kingdom where he's working is where his heart is. And I want to join him there. And guess what? When I begin to see God working, I begin to spend time with him. And he begins to talk to me about where he's working. When I go there, I go there with purpose. I go there with authority. I go there without fear. And I go there to declare 
the will of God in that place. See, I've seen sick people and my heart's moved with compassion on them before and I prayed for them and nothing happened. Well, I do know this. Something did happen. I believe God responded to the fact that may I may not have seen a physical movement, but I prayed and I asked the Father to intercede. And so I may not see it, but I trust He's working. But I have never, I want you to hear this, I have never, ever, never, ever, never Heard God say, pray for them, prayed for them, and not seen something happen. So he responds because I'm his kid. And he works on people's behalf just because I asked him to. I'm his kid. But when he prompts me, there's a whole nother level of faith. There's a whole nother level of boldness. There's a whole nother level because I have heard him in time of prayer. And in that moment, I didn't come up with the idea God did. When it's a God idea, I'm going to run a long way with it. God responds. Jesus showed us that. He responded as Jesus prayed and heaven opened. Let's go to the next one. Prayer creates divine encounters. Prayer creates divine encounters. In Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 13, we see where Jesus selected the 12 apostles. He had these followers, disciples, and he began to, uh, uh, the time came where he needed to select the apostles. It says, now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Who went out to pray? Are you all awake? Cricket, cricket, cricket. Jesus went out to pray. And how long did he pray? All night. He wasn't studying for a test. He wasn't cramming for finals. He was wanting to hear the voice of God because he was making divine connections. It says, and when it was day, he called himself to himself. And from them, he chose 12 whom he also named apostles. When you think about this idea of divine connections, I believe God wants to create divine connections in our lives. Supernatural divine connections to where life on life, investment on investment. And we need God to guide us in that process. We need him to guide us into those divine connections. Now, what does that look like? It's different for everybody. There are pastors that need divine connections where people connect into our lives and speak and mentor to us on a spiritual level about how to pastor Brother David spoke into my life for 10 years on how to pastor. I am not the same person, thank God, that I was when I first came. Why? Because Brother David, through a divine connection, prayed and hired someone that was probably not qualified to come in into a role that I did not deserve, but he mentored me for 10 years and then passed a baton to me. A divine connection that happened as a result of prayer. I'll tell you the story very quickly. We found out that the associate pastor from community was leaving. Randy Ayers was a very popular guy. People, uh, he's doing very well in, in San Antonio area. And my sister calls and says, hey, community church doesn't have an associate. Why don't you put in your application? I said, well, I've never really put in an application for a church. I really don't feel comfortable doing that. If, uh, you know, I'll just see what happens. Because I was also interviewing for a senior pastor position at a church, a little smaller than community at that time, but real similar to our size at this time. And I was thinking, you know, I'll be good. And my dad was dying with cancer. My sister tells my mom that community has an opening and I'm not putting in an application. (laughs) So mama got involved. Called Brother David and said, can he sit at your right hand or your left hand? No. That was James and John, sorry. Uh, Mom get involved and said, you need to just do it. Maybe God's doing something. So I put in my application. I, I sent it in. Call Brother David on the phone, say, hey, I'm going to be sending my application. And he talks to me a while, very gracious, and then he says this. He calls me back and says, Daniel, uh, I appreciate you putting in your application. I, I'm real proud of what I hear about going in your ministry, but I'm looking for someone a little older and more mature. I say, okay. I got this other church. I'm, it's gravy right now. I'm, like, I'm good. And, and now my mom's off my back. She's mad at Brother David, but hey. And about three weeks later, I've gone down to interview at this other church. I'm coming back. They're, they're preparing to vote. Mary Beth's about, uh, she's pe- pregnant with twins. She's walking like this and kind of stuff. And we're just getting ready to, we know a move's coming, but we believe it's to southern Illinois. 
We're picking out houses, doing all that stuff. And so we go down there and it just doesn't feel right. Something suddenly doesn't feel right. And then Brother David calls and says, hey, Daniel, I'd like you to come down to interview. Well, I'm not stupid. Uh, you know, I'm going, oh, I thought I was too young, too immature, and you were going in a different direction. He said, well, I know. He still agreed. Yes, you are. <laughs> I know, but every time I pray, you're the one that comes to my heart. See, what happened was God saw a divine connection that didn't make sense. It may not have even been what the church needed or he needed at that moment, but God saw a connection. And he poured into my life. And if you know Brother David, to get him to pour into your life, you have to twist his arm a little bit. So I had to sit in his office and make him talk to me. But he poured into my life. Divine connections happen when people pray. I'll tell you, if you ever wondered, there are two things that I know about Brother David. Transparent, he is who he is. And he's a man of prayer. Amen. See, Jesus impacted Brother David. And he saw some habits in Christ. He may not have called them that, but they became a part of his life. And he imparted them into my life. See, when we look at it, what connections need to be made in your life? God can make some divine connections that will change your destiny, shape your future, reorient your character, uh, open up opportunities that will have never been there otherwise. I'm telling you, I was a football coach and a public school teacher, and look what he's done. There's something that God does when he gets involved, when people pray, hear his voice, and make divine connections. Are you a business owner? You need divine connections in your life. Are you a city manager? You need divine connections in your life. You need God to put people in your life that will show you how to bring the kingdom to bear in every area. It's not just divine connections for promotion's sake. It's divine connections for kingdom's sake. Prayer changes the spiritual atmosphere. And so I want to look at prayer opens heaven, prayer creates divine connections, and prayer changes the spiritual atmosphere. Turn with me to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 36. I'm going to go very quickly. I, my son told me uh, yesterday when I say, he said, every time you say your last point, you go another 15 minutes. So this is my last point, and my goal is to be under 10. I'm nothing if I'm not competitive. When he had this to say, he went on ahead going to Jerusalem. And when it came to pass that he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany and the mount called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples. And he said, go into this village. I'm in the wrong place. Chapter 9. I'm going way, I'm way out there. Chapter 9. In verse 28. Now it came to pass about eight days after saying that uh, he took Peter, John, and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And he prayed the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah who appeared in glory and spoke of his a decease which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Then it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he had said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful and entered the cloud, as they entered the cloud. And a voice came from the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. And when the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone. But they kept quiet and told no one in those days any of the things that they had seen. Now, I want you to notice what happens. Jesus invites them in. Jesus begins to pray. They're not even really praying. They're sleepy. And at the, as they pray, this transfiguration begins to take place. They wake up and see, do my eyes deceive me? Oh, my goodness. And they recognized who it was. And they, their answer, they knew they needed to know it. For, it's good that we were here. But the human response was, let me build an altar. Their spirit knew it was good, and their response wasn't quite correct. 
I want you to know that what happened in my heart, I believe with all my heart, is Jesus, doing nothing on accident, invited these three in. He began to pray knowing that when he prayed, the supernatural atmosphere showed up. But in this moment, he says they need to see in reality what happens in the supernatural. Jesus Jesus probably had this experience every time he prayed because the supernatural and the natural were just normal to him. But they needed to see it. So in this moment, he allowed the veil between the natural and supernatural to open up. And they're going, oh my goodness, it was good that we saw this. Why? Because you and I need to live in the constant reality that when we pray, the supernatural atmosphere changes. The Bible says where two or more are gathered, who's in the midst of them? He said, I'm in the midst of you, Jesus, the Spirit, God. He's in the midst when two or more of us gather around. When we're here right now praying in a corporate setting, the spiritual dynamic of Orange County begins to change. When you and your spouse pray together, the spiritual atmosphere of your home begins to change. When you and your coworkers pray together, the spiritual dynamic of your workplace begins to change. Prayer changes the atmosphere in which we live. Do we believe it? Is it good that we were here to see what God is doing? We don't need to build altars. We need to get on our knees. We don't need to build altars. We need to proclaim our love for God and begin to engage him and watch the spirit begin to change the atmosphere around us. What in your life needs to change? Do you need to allow God To change an atmosphere in your home, in your workplace, in the church. You know what? We don't change things the way the world does. You know what? There are going to be things that happen in life that we don't like. And the world changes it by popularity and by vote and by getting more people on your side, by demonizing who you're upset with and getting more people to agree with you. And that's how the world does it. That's not how the church does it. The church gets on its knees and begins to pray. And God begins to change the atmosphere. And in that atmosphere, I'm telling you, things can't stay the same when God's presence is revealed. You will never see a time in Scripture where the manifest presence of God showed up and He went away shrieking like defeat. When God shows up, the enemy runs. Darkness is expelled by the light. When you and I pray, when we corporately seek God's face, we don't have to reach for the world's tools for change and injustice. We reach for God's tools for change and injustice. We don't reach for the world's tools for controlling someone to make them do what we want to do. We reach for the kingdom and watch God begin to change the atmosphere. Are there things in our lives that need to change? Yes, there are. Are there things in our city that needs to change? Yes, there are. In our homes, yes. In our church, yes. Get on our knees and petition heaven and talk to God and build each other up and love each other and forgive and restore and watch God move in a supernatural way in our lives. We can open up heaven with prayer. We can make divine connections through prayer. And we can change the atmosphere through prayer. Jesus showed us these things. His habit was there so that we would glean from him. This morning, I hope you've gleaned that your prayers matter. God longs to talk to you. Let's let's real briefly talk about how we can change this atmosphere. I want to give you three things that you can look at this week. Number one... Every one of us need a prompt for prayer. A prompt for prayer. A prompt for prayer can be anything that gets your attention. Walking in a cool building on a hot day can be a prompt for prayer. You ever walked into a building and thought, man, that feels good. Good. Associate that with prayer. Someone serving you a blow of a blue. Anybody got the interpretation? That was bad. Anybody serve you a bowl of bluebell ice cream? That can be a prompt for prayer. Anytime you're driving down the road and a blue car passes, be a prompt for prayer. I don't care what it is. You care. 
You find in your life, what is it? When I brush my teeth, I will pray. When I get in the shower, I will pray. When I eat a meal, I will pray. When I pass blue cars, I will pray. When I hit a pothole, I will pray. What is it that will prompt your prayer life? Find some prompts and use them. And you will begin to see your prayer life increasing. We prompt, because God, I believe, will begin to send us in more air-conditioned buildings. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. So often we try to impress God with our prayers. God doesn't need to be impressed and no one else needs to know him. If we worry about impressing God or other people with our prayers, our prayer life's going to shrivel up because we can't impress God with our, with our ability to talk. God talks to us not to be impressed by us, but because he loves us and he wants a relationship. And we, quite frankly, don't need to worry about how other people pray. Our prayers aren't for other people's benefit. They're for God's. And when they become for other people's business, it quit being about God. And so, keep it simple. Just pray from your heart. Use a prompt. Keep it simple. And go where it goes. I remember beating myself up many times because I'd start praying and then I, my mind would go somewhere I didn't want it to go. And I'd say, God, I'm sorry. I'm really trying to pray. If you were talking with someone that you loved... And while you were talking to them, their heart kept drifting somewhere else. There was something on their heart, but they thought that, I'm going to talk to you about cars, but on my heart is my family. But I'm going to talk to Buddy about cars. And every time I talk to Buddy about cars, my heart drifts to family, and then I apologize. I'm sorry, I shouldn't be talking about my family. I'm talking about cars. You think Buddy would look at me and say, Daniel, why don't you talk about your family? Obviously, that matters to you. Because he loves me. You love me, right? He loves me. <laughs> he knows where my heart's going. See, we apologize to God when he knows our hearts. If our heart drifts there, talk to him about it. That's what's real in that moment. Quit praying religious prayers. They will kill your prayer life. Religious prayers are from hell. They're not from heaven. Pray. Use every prompt for prayer. Keep it simple and go where your heart goes with God. And you'll find a richness in your prayer life that will open heaven, that will bring divine connections, and will, and will see the supernatural released over your life. The prayer partners, could you make your way to the front, please? Church, will you please stand to your feet? This morning, I've talked a lot about prayer, but the truth is, the first prayer we need to pray is giving our lives to Jesus Christ. The first response we need to make is saying, Jesus, you're it. I give my life to you. There are some people here that need to give their life to Christ today. That the Holy Spirit has been pursuing you. Maybe nothing that I've said, but he has been, he has been pursuing you because his great love for you. I want you to know this morning, if you're here and you've been away from God for a while or maybe you've never known him, he loves you. He wants your good, but he wants it inside of a relationship with him. He's not going to take away bad out of your life until you come to Him and you discover life in Him. Because life outside of Him, there's no promises. But life in Him is abundant and full of glory. It's full of joy and mercy and peace. If you don't know joy and mercy and peace and abundance in your life, He can't give it to you outside of His kingdom. But come to His kingdom. Love Him and trust Him. And you'll know life like never before. If you've been away for a while and talking to him quit a long time ago and today you want to talk to him again, let's, let's make it right with him. Let's come to him today and be reminded of his goodness, of his love for you. These prayer partners are here for you to respond, but they're also here for you to respond to the Holy Spirit. Maybe what I've talked about isn't where you are right now. But the Holy Spirit, maybe there's something in your life and you want to come into agreement. Prayer and the prayer of agreement changes things. These prayer partners are here for you. If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes, I want to ask, if you're here and you need to make a commitment to Christ, a rededication of your life, if you're here and you say, I want to be right with God today, raise your hand. Let me see your hands, please. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Any other hands? Yes, sir, I see it. Any other hands? I want to be right with God today. I, I, I felt his love. I know his presence. I'm tired of being somewhere else. 
For those of you that raised your hands, I'm going to pray for you, but I want you to come up here to these prayer partners and tell them, I'm right with God today. I'm his and he's mine. Father, for those that raise their hands, I pray blessings over them that they have made a profession of faith before you, that they're saying they want you in their lives. They want to be restored to you. They, they are asking for forgiveness of sins. They're asking for redemption of life and, and a destiny, a future clothed in your presence. Father, make them a part of your family. Restore joy and peace to their lives and don't allow anything, any lie that enemy would say to keep them in their seat today. Let them come boldly to make a proclamation that they are yours. They are yours and you're theirs. Father, I pray your blessings upon them right now and speak freedom to them in the name of Jesus. Those of you that raised your hand for that purpose, in just a moment when we start worshiping, you're going to be free to come up and pray. And I encourage you, make sure you tell someone. But others here today that need to pray, Maybe something going on in your life. Maybe healing. Maybe a touch of some part. These prayer partners have spent all week preparing for this moment. Let's worship just a moment. And if the Holy Spirit moves on you, let's come and pray. Mary, uh, Mary Beth's not here. I'll be in the red room in just a moment. If you're visiting today or if you make a decision for Christ, I'd love to see you in the red room. Go out these doors. Turn to your left. But let's go from this place today knowing we've heard God's voice. And we're walking into his destiny. And we are going to be a change agent. We're going to join other churches. And we're going to see Orange become a city on a hill for the glory of God. Amen? Amen? Let's worship. If you raised your hand, make your way forward, please. The Lord of this nation, you are. You're the light in this darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. And there is no one like God. There is no one like you, Lord. Father, we believe that this morning, that greater things are yet to come. Father, I thank you that you are using this body of believers to further your kingdom. God, open our eyes this week so that we can see opportunities to further your kingdom. See that we can touch lives. Father God, I pray that you would open our eyes to opportunities to get before you in prayer, to connect with you in prayer so that we can change the atmosphere that's around us, Lord. Thank you. And right now, I just bless these people. God, I speak your blessing over them. Blessings of richness, Lord God, riches of mercy and grace. Father, Pray the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. That he would be gracious to you. That he would lift his countenance up on, upon you. That his eyes would follow you. Once again, not in judgment, but in favor. That his eyes would follow you all the days of your life. That you would be blessed. That you would be blessed in your coming, in your going, in your rising up, and in your going that you would be a blessed people. Why? So that we can be a blessing to this world. Amen and amen. You be blessed this week.
Bless God, bless others. You are dismissed. You're the God of the city. You're the King of His people. You're the Lord of this nation. You're the light in this darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. There is no one like you, Lord. There is no one like God. God. We believe, Lord, as we sing. Yeah.